hey, that's pretty good. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our own eyes, what we've looked at and touched with our own hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and we testify to it and we declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us so that you also may have fellowship with us. God is light and in God there is no darkness at all. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus, the righteous. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and for the sins of the whole world. For this great gift, we lift our voices in praise and thanksgiving as we join together for our call to worship. Lord God, we have gathered here in your spirit. With hearts hungry for our life journey. In the midst of our wilderness travels, we yearn for holy refreshment. Through your loving and healing spirit. We yearn now in our time together to experience you. In fresh, new, and abundant ways. Prepare us now for this time of worship. And may the power and promise of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us. Let us pray. Father God, in our more honest moments, we confess that we often ask ourselves, what in the world are we doing here? I mean, why is it that we get up early on a day off, get all dressed up and come to a place where we know they're going to ask us for money? And if that's not enough, we're often made to feel guilty for the things that we've done, for things that we haven't done. We were taught that coming to church is something that you desire, but in all honesty, there are times when we really don't feel like it. There are many things that pull at our attention and distract us. God, in this time of worship, help us to rediscover why it is we truly come to church. We know deep down in our hearts the things that really matter. To love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. To love and to serve others in the name of Christ. In our gathering together, help us to tear down all those things that keep us from meeting this calling. Help us rediscover who we are and what you've called us to do. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.
promises of Christ. I'm kept by the rhythm of the promises of Christ. I'm kept by the rhythm of the promises of Christ. I'm kept by the rhythm of the promises of Christ. Many of you here today watch the Fox News Channel. You can raise that's, you can raise your hand. That's fine. Okay, I I know it's, it doesn't appeal to everyone, uh, and I know sometimes people are a little uh, leery to uh, make it known that they watch uh, Fox News. I I do. Uh, I freely admit that. And uh, if you are a regular uh, watcher of Fox News, you are familiar with um, the O'Reilly Factor, and of course the No Spin Zone. Uh, in, in, in theory, at least, uh, it is a program in which uh, various political issues of the day are looked at uh, as objectively as possible, making judgments drawn from the facts. And uh, it is termed as the no-spin zone. Spin, as you are aware, is, has really become a, a, a big part of our political process today. Uh, truth is, can't just be looked at. It has to be spun, you know, so that we are able to look at it from certain perspectives. Uh, usually what spin is, uh, is trying to explain something negative, uh, in a positive light. It occurs to me that when we come to our time of confession, we, like Bill O'Reilly, uh, are in a no spin zone. We live our lives as human beings, and I mean, it's part of the human condition, that we justify, or at least make the attempt to justify, all those things that we do wrong. We, we exhibit that sometimes in, in how we judge other people. You know, we, uh, other people sin, we just make mistakes. Uh, and we, so thus we spin what we do. There was a book that was written some time back, and it says, uh, Father, forgive me for I have sinned, but I have several excellent excuses. And isn't, isn't that really how it is? I mean, when we, we try to justify those things that we do, but, you know, in, in many ways, when we come to God in prayer, especially in confession, that is our no-spin zone. Uh, that is a place where we can, we can try to spin the things that we've done any way we want to, but you know what? God's not buying it because God is truth. God knows truth, and he knows us to our very core. What he asked us to do is to recognize the truth about ourselves, to admit our sinfulness. The ironic twist in all of this is that we try to spin our sin, as it were, because we're afraid of how others or how God will see us. When in reality, we have a God that can't stop loving us no matter what we do. There is no sin great enough that you've committed that can keep God from loving you to his fullest. So this morning, let's drop all the spin, let's drop all the mass, let's drop all of that, and uh, let us enter into our time of confession. Let us confess our sins now before God and before each other. Merciful Savior, we confess that we have been ungrateful recipients of this vast treasure that is your Holy Scripture. We have heard your word, but not obeyed it. Believe the right things, but not live them. 
claim to know you, but not follow the life you model. You call us to trust, but we fail to loosen our grip of control. You invite us to abide, but we chase our own purposes. You give the Sabbath for our rest, but we ignore it. Lord, forgive us, have mercy upon us, renew us. Brothers and sisters, here is your good news for today. The mercy of God is sure. The mercy of God is unfailing. As his beloved children, you are free to serve and to love. Because in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, your sins have been forgiven. <clears throat> Having been granted grace and forgiveness from Almighty God himself, we are now bold to approach his throne in order to offer prayers of intercession on behalf of those whom we love, those whom we know. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Holy God, you haven't just called us to be disciples. You called us to also make disciples. Help us this morning to be grounded in your word in such a way that we can recognize those places where you're working in our lives and in the lives of others. Let your light and your love shine through us in such a way that our lives become a witness for your glory. As we pray this morning, Lord, we especially want to remember those men and women in, who are serving in our armed forces, who are separated from their families, who perhaps are even serving in harm's way. Never let us forget their sacrifice and the sacrifice of all those that went before them, uh, their li those that have given their lives in service to our country. Help us always to keep that uh, in our first and foremost in our prayers. As we pray today, we also call to mind those among us who are facing uh, circumstances in life, situations that are uh, overwhelming. We live in such a time that that uh, we are often in places where it seems as though there's nowhere to turn. For these, we lift them up to you and we commend them over into your love and care, especially those who were have been victims and who are suffering so greatly from uh, the hur the recent hurricane that came up the East Coast. We ask that you would grant wisdom and discernment to all of those who are facing difficult choices today that you would enable them to think clearly and, and be able to sense your presence in that process. Bring comfort to all of those who grieve, those that mourn the loss of a loved one, or those who are uh, just mourning a change in their life circumstances. May all of these find hope in your promise of resurrection. Bring healing and grace to all of those who are recovering from surgery or illness, all those who are exhausted and worn down. And Lord, we ask that you bring that same grace and healing to all those, all those broken places in our lives. We give thanks to you this morning for our, our lives, for this community, for our families, for our friends, the pleasure of creation, and the blessing of your people. In all of your grace and mercy, we ask that you would hear our prayer. For the sake of Jesus the Christ, who taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat>
Kids, kids, wake up, wake up. It's Sunday. We gotta get ready for church. Brian, Brian, wake up, honey. Brian, get up, get up. Oh. Okay, I'm gonna hop in the shower real quick. You get the kids ready and then we'll get going. No. Okay. Hey, what? you just lay out their clothes because it takes me five minutes. Honey, That's perfect. Seriously. Well, we're already late for church. Hey, Go get yourself dressed. Did you pick up my stuff from the dry cleaners? Uh, ooh. Make it, break it. Make it, break it. Make it, break it. Okay, Jack, I'm gonna make you waffles. Can I have a sandwich? Yes, but you gotta make it by yourself. Jack. Okay. This is all I could find, and the zipper's broken. All right, I'll go grab a safety pin. I got the high score! <sighs> Anna, what are you doing? Daddy, I'm painting your fingernails. Well, that's great, sweetie, but go get dressed. Stay still, okay? Honey. Anna! Come on, let's go! Uh, uh. Honey, okay, everybody needs to eat. Here you go. Here you go, okay, here you go. I forgot my shoes! Uh, honey, we gotta go no. back. Nobody's taking off their shoes. And I want everybody to understand that we're oh, going to what? We made it. Yep. Hear these words of our first lection for this morning from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 27 through 34. Be ready. Time's coming. God's decree when I will plant people and animals in Israel and Judah just like a farmer plants seed. And in the same way that I uh, earlier relentlessly pulled up and tore down and took up and demolished, so now I'm sticking with them as they start over building and planting. When that time comes, you won't hear that old proverb anymore. It was the parents that ate the uh, green apples, but the children got the stomach ache. No, now each person will pay for his own sin. You eat green apples, then you won't get sick. Time is coming when I will make a brand new covenant with Israel and Judah. Not going to be a repeat of that covenant I made with their ancestors when I took their hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, even though I did my part as their master. This is a brand new covenant that I will make with Israel when the time comes. I will put my law within them. I'll write it right on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they have to go around setting up schools to teach one another about God. They'll know me firsthand. The dull, the bright, the smart, the slow. And I'll wipe the slate clean for all of them. I'll forget that they ever sinned. God's decree. Our second lection is from uh, Luke's Gospel, uh, chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Jesus told them a story showing that it was necessary for them to pray consistently and never quit. He said, there once upon a time was a judge in a city who uh, didn't give God any thought. He cared nothing for people. But a widow in that town kept after him. She said, my rights are being violated. Protect me. But he never would give her the time of day. 
But this just went on and on and on. And finally he said to himself, you know, I don't care anything about God, care even less about what people think. But because this widow's not going to quit badging me, I better do something and see that she gets justice. Otherwise, I'm going to get beaten up black and blue by her pounding. And then the master said, do you hear what that judge as corrupt as he is is saying? So what makes you think that God won't step in and work justice for his chosen people that continue to cry out for help? Won't he stick up for them? I'm telling you that he will. He won't drag his feet. But how much of that kind of persistent faith will the Son of Man find on earth when he returns? pray Lord your word is living and active it's it's a very powerful means by which we uh, hear you speak to us give us ears to hear this morning what you're saying rather than just hearing what we want to hear give us courage to measure our attitudes and actions by your truth and uh, give us a desire to align our lives by your call to discipleship. Light us with your spirit and set our hearts ablaze with yearning to know you and to love you ever more deeply. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I want to use as the foundation for the message this morning this text from Paul's second letter to Timothy, uh, beginning reading this morning in Chapter 3, verse 14. I encourage you to follow along with me. 
But don't let it phase you. Stick with what you learned and believed, sure of the integrity of your teachers. Why, you took in the sacred scriptures with your mother's milk. There's nothing like the written word of God for showing you the way to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Every part of scripture is God-breathed and uh, useful in one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us how to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for those tasks that God has for us. And I can't impress this on you too strongly. God's looking over your shoulder. Christ himself is the judge with the final say on everybody, living and dead. He's about to break into open with his rules, so proclaim the message with intensity. Keep on your watch. Challenge, warn, urge your people. Don't ever quit. Just keep it simple. Now, one of the things you're going to find is that there's going to be times when people don't have any stomach for Solid teaching, but they'll just fill up on spiritual junk food, you know, catchy opinions that tickle their fancy. They'll turn their backs on truth. They'll chase mirages. But you, as for you, you, you keep your eye on what you're doing. Accept the hard times along with the good. Keep that message alive. Do a thorough job as God's servant. The word of God for the people of God. One of the things that I've always been impressed with is sort of the cyclical nature of history. Uh, it's, it, I guess the simplest way to put it is what goes around comes around. Uh, even though we live in, in probably the most technological age that's ever existed, we find that there are still a great deal of similarities of things in the past. Same tr certain trends just continue to repeat. That's one of the reasons why I've still got bell-bottom slacks hanging in my closet, because I'm sure one day they're going to come back, and when they do, I'm going to be ready, you see. They're going to be in style. As much as the world has changed in the last 3,000 years, it seems that everything does kind of go full circle. Roughly 3,000 years ago, give or take, the Word of God first came down to Moses inscribed on tablets just like today. Well, okay, maybe not just like today. You see, those tablets that Moses had were made out of stone. Ours today are made out of plastic and glass and silicone. Now, those of you who are, who are well, are at least comfortable with computers and, and our technology, you are aware that Bible programs have long been available for your computer. If you have it on a tablet, uh, there are apps that you can have on your either your Windows or your Android tablet that, that contain the Bible. But there is a new trend uh, on the horizon. And that trend is to make the Word of God available in hotels by swapping out those Gideon Bibles, the old printed kind, and replacing them with Amazon Kindles. Now, those Kindles are preloaded with the Bible. Of course, now, uh, if you're a guest, you can also download other uh, religious texts and other texts to read if you want to for a fee, of course. This is being tested in a number of markets, you see, because uh, they want to know whether or not uh, this is going to be an idea that kind of flies. Now, we don't really have any idea how many guests are actually using the Bible on Kindles. But just some recent data that comes down to us from Gideon's International tells us that about 25% of people who check into hotels read the Gideon Bible. You know, if you pull open the drawer in the bedside stand, you know, there's that Gideon Bible. I mean, it's ever-present. It means that... Uh, 25% of hotel guests read those Bibles. Potentially, that means the Bible uh, reaches out to more than 2,300 people over the, the six-year life expectancy of that Bible. So the Bible, in whatever format we might find it, has that kind of power. And that's no doubt the reason why the Apostle Paul in this second letter that he's written to his young protege Timothy, he reminds him that every part of Scripture is God-breathed 
And it is useful in one way or another for showing us truth, for exposing our rebellion, for correcting our mistakes, for t teaching us how we ought to live. The ironic twist in all this is that, that as, even as Paul was pinning those words to young Timothy, it never occurred to him that one day those very words that he was writing down on that piece of parchment would have been, would be considered scripture. Now, in the off chance that you hadn't been paying any attention in Sunday school, there was no New Testament in Paul's time. In point of fact, it would be more accurate to say that both he and all his co-workers in the faith were actually still living the New Testament. All of those texts, the corpus of the New Testament, evolved slowly over the span of about well, roughly three, four hundred years of the early church's history. Even before the Gospels appeared on the scene, uh, the writings of the Apostle Paul were the very first that were copied and uh, passed around from church to church. But even as late as the second century, Paul's letters were considered to be good advice. They were considered to be maybe authoritative, but they certainly weren't considered to be scripture. Eventually, the church did uh, accept some writings as scripture, uh, the four gospels, acts, certain epistles. Uh, they designated those as the canon of the church. But here, when Paul is talking about these scriptures that were inspired by God, God breathed, he was thinking of the Hebrew Bible essentially what makes up our Old Testament today. That was the Bible from which the apostles, for, uh, Peter, Paul, all the rest of them, that was, the, the, that was what they went to for their text. And even though it predated Jesus, they were able to say that Jesus was the fulfillment of all the pro prophecies that were found there. If you go back and look at Peter's very first sermon to that Pentecost crowd in Acts, he uses those Old Testament uh, prophetic texts as foundations for his message. But now the, the, the apostles in the early church evangelists also recognized that the coming of Jesus really kind of changed everything. You see, God was doing something brand new. Earlier, when Paul is writing to Timothy, he says, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, a descendant of David, that is my gospel. Now, Apparently, from the context of the letter, we know that, that Paul was in jail at that time. He mentions being chained like a criminal. But then in contrast to his chains, Paul says, and you, even using those chains as a metaphor, he said the word of God is not changed. And that word of God that he's talking about there is the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which becomes the essence, you see, of our New Testament. So in this letter to Timothy, Paul commends to his younger colleague the scripture that we know as the Old Testament and also the gospel, the message that is the essence of the new one. All of that, according to Paul, is the word of God. That is our book of faith today. The contrast. Paul mentions between his prison chains and that unchained word of God is a very important reality. All of us at one time or another have experienced those, uh, well, I guess you could call them imprisoning situations. You know, circumstances, quandaries that we find ourselves in. It seems like the walls are closing in. There's nowhere for us to go. And yet we also find that the Bible has a liberating effect. Free. Now, like a lot of you folks who are here this morning, I was exposed to the Bible almost kind of like the I can identify with Timothy, you know, almost with my mother's milk. I, I, I never remember a time when the, when the scriptures were not part of our home. Throughout the, throughout my early life, I had preachers and teachers, even my parents. They all told me what the Bible said. They informed me about all the truth that was in the Bible, all the power they said was there in the Bible. But it, for me, it was a whole lot like listening to folks describe what scrambled eggs taste like. You know, it was interesting. 
Uh, and sometimes it was even entertaining, but really wasn't anything that impacted me because I never experienced the actual taste of scrambled eggs. It was all hearsay. And so as a young man, I began to really seriously question the Christian faith. All Everything I'd ever been taught about religion, all the values that I had ever been taught, all those were called into question. So I guess I was about in my mid-twenties when I got tired. I got tired of all the hearsay they say and we say about the Bible. I decided I wanted to know for myself. And so I made the commitment to wade through the Bible, the entire Bible, cover to cover. Now, I'll confess to you, it wasn't easy reading, but you know me. I was determined that I was going to read it through and I was going to come to some conclusion about the about the truth and the message now i have always maintained that the holy spirit never led me as much as it dragged me kicking and screaming uh, it took me three times i read it through three times i'm tenacious if not if nothing else and about halfway through that third time that's when i came to the realization that there really, truly was something profound and real and concrete there. Now, did reading the Bible answer all my questions? <laughs> Not hardly. But I have come to learn that despite whatever unresolved questions I might have, the Bible's word has kept me grounded in truth and reality, and it's the words of that same scripture that have freed and sustained me and nurtured me in more than one tough situation over the years. As Paul assures Timothy in our text, that he says the word of God is freeing word it is a liberating word it breaks open those prisons that life tends to to build around us. Sometimes we might find ourselves behind real bars, but the Word of God can be just as freeing when we are chained in our own psychological or emotional or circumstantial prison. Now, I'm not a betting man. But if I were, I would be willing to bet that 99 and 44, 100% of all the sermons that you've ever heard preached about the Bible began with the preacher telling you how hard it was to read the Bible and that it took commitment and it took energy to stay with it. Okay. The Bible is not what one would expect of a book of religious instruction. If I were going to write a book that were going to tell people how to live their lives, I wouldn't include things like Numbers. You ever tried to read Numbers or Chronicles or Ezekiel? Boy, you talk about a snooze fest. The only thing it's good for is to put you to sleep. And I'd organize it a little bit differently so it made a little bit more sense. But you see, this Bible of ours has a style. It has a purpose all of its own. And the Bible has succeeded sometimes even in spite of itself. On its surface, it doesn't look like the kind of book that would be a bestseller. It's long. It's full of a lot of dull, a lot of, a lot of difficult portions. And while there is a plot, you really got to pay attention in order to find it. But brothers and sisters, I'm telling you this morning that that plot is worth discovering because it is the tale of a love affair between God and the human race. The Bible tells us about God's love for us. So in that regard, the poorly educated fellow that's got to kind of sound out the words and use his finger when he reads the Bible, but trying to live by what it says is actually closer to the life force of the Bible than that intellectual that reads it just for its historical significance. Bottom line is, boys and girls, the Bible is essentially pretty easy to understand. The problem is that we Christians very often pretend we don't understand it because we know that the minute that we admit that we understand something, that we're going to be obliged to act according to what it says. 
and speaking about the Bible's life forms. Those of you who have been long-time Bible readers have no doubt noticed you can be reading along and you can read a passage you've probably read 50 times before, but then all of a sudden something just kind of jumps out at you. You never saw it before. You don't know where it came from. Just jumps out of the page. Some word of encouragement, a ray of hope, some guidance, a conviction perhaps, whatever it was that you happened to need at that particular time. The Bible possesses that uncanny capacity. Like paintings of the great master, the scriptures soak up something from the lives of everybody who's ever read it and interacted with it over the ages. I want to share with you this morning four metaphors that suggest ways of viewing the Bible. First, the Bible is a finger that points to God. Anything that points to God is asking us uh, to believe is not asking us to believe in itself, but rather that which points. It's a mistake a lot of Christians make. They become so uh, enhanced and, and so committed to the Bible that it literally becomes an idol for them. They worship the Bible. They forget that the Bible is pointing to something else. It's pointing to God. God is the one we're supposed to worship, not the Bible. Being a Christian does not mean primarily believing in the finger, but believing in the God to which the finger points. Second of all, the Bible is a lens through which we view God. Now, I'll admit, the lens isn't perfect. And there, to some degree, it might distort the way we see things. But it's still the clearest view of God that we have. Third, the Bible is a sacrament like communion. It enhances our experience of God's presence. Communion doesn't ask us to believe in the bread and the wine, but let them act as a kind of a go-between, like a doorway, if you will, to deepen our experience of God. The Bible is the same way. It's like a doorway, a window, a go-between between us and God. And fourth, as the Bible is, as Peter dubbed it in one of his letters, a lamp shining in a dark place. Now, a lamp doesn't eliminate all the darkness. It does, however, enable you to find your way as you go through it. Now, all of this brings me to my final point, which seems to be just in time. <laughs> you cannot benefit from the Bible. Hear this. You cannot reap the benefits of the Bible unless you've got some knowledge of what's in it. Uh and brothers and sisters, as much as I hate to say it, there's some of you sitting out there, you don't have a clue what's in it. I'm guessing that there's probably a large percentage of you that don't read the Bible at all. You just rely on what I say. Or what your Sunday school teacher says. Or what that TV preacher says. Or maybe you just rely on what Grandma always told you about what the Bible was about. And that's one of the reasons why the atheists don't have any trouble ripping you to shreds when you try to talk to them about it. Because trust me, I'm telling you, they do read the Bible and they know what's in it. Which ironically gives me a lot more hope for them than it does for good old church folks that never crack its cover. I saw a cartoon not long ago. Young man's talking on the telephone and he's saying to somebody, he says, I think I have found the secret to unraveling the mysteries of the Bible. I've started to read it. To know what's in it, boys and girls, you got to read it. Read it! But don't read it for its mystery. Instead, read it for how it can convey you into the presence of God and enable you to see, even if imperfectly, your way to God and hear his call for you. And that can happen whether you're reading the Bible on stone tablets, whether you're reading it on a printed page, or on a plastic screen. Let us pray. A great and faithful God, truth seems to be a very rare commodity in our world today. Lies, half-truths, misinformation, they're defended, they're justified, while truth-telling 
especially in the public arena as well as in our own private lives, is very often criticized and sometimes it's even punished. It is against that backdrop that your words stand as, as a kind of a beacon of truth that is timeless, that is sure, that is trustworthy. We thank you that your word is new every time we read it, that it stays relevant no matter how much the world may change, that it's a reliable witness to your ongoing presence and your activity in our lives and in the lives of others. May its wisdom, its insight, its truth infuse us with a greater love for you and for all of creation. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.